Hello, I am very happy to be here to talk about my book, Frida Kahlo, Fashion as the Art of Being. Excuse me, my English is not perfect. I was always amazed how fashion, which by definition lives in constant change, has been upset with Frida Kahlo for decades. Why is it that she continues to be so modern in the 21st century? And how is it that Frida, in spite of being a handicapped woman and half indigenous belonging to a developing country and not taking part in the show business, since she wasn't an actress nor a singer or a dancer, slipped into the list of the most iconic women in the 20th century alongside Jackie Kennedy or Maria Callas? During the 18 years that I was editor-in-chief for Spanish Elle magazine, I attended numerous international runways where I saw Frida catwalk many times for the most important designers around the world. Jean-Paul Gaultier, Givenchy, Valentino, Lagerfeld, Lacroix, Kenzo, Moschino, and others. I have seen her influence several times in music, movies, and the best international fashion magazines. She has been remembered by famous actresses, models, and singers like Monica Bellucci, Naomi Campbell, Kate Moss, Claudia Schiffer, Beyonce, Madonna, Patti Smith, and Coldplay, among others. In the 2013, shortly after moving to Mexico, the Huffington Post asked me to write a blog about the recently opened exhibition about Frida's dresses. Looking at this amazing display at the Casa Azul Museum in Mexico City, I started to remember about all these images of Rangray Frida and decided that this topic deserved to be pursued further. At the end of that article, I expressed my desire for there to be a book about Frida's influence in contemporary fashion. It was a personal challenge I had set myself in order to take the step of making a book. The article was one of the most read articles at the time, and this led me to confirm what I had always felt. Frida Spirits lives on more than half a century later. Frida Kahlo, Fashion as the Art of Being, is a realization of that dream. These are 20 fashion lessons that Mrs. Kahlo left us that I discovered right in my book. In all the lesson, I will show you an image of Frida followed by a fashion editorial. Number one, more is better. Frida Kahlo knew that life is a theater and fashion was her costume. Fashion is a magic wand that makes visible the invisible. It is an optical effect that Frida knew how to employ with shrewd intelligence and artistic intention. Her impressive hands always painted with red nail polish and using a variety of rings, even several in one finger or in all fingers. Big flowers crowned with breads intertwined with a voluminous handkerchief, jewelry and embroidery, a mustache and a unibrow everything in excess but harmonically balanced at the same time. Frida challenged restraint and containment laws in an aesthetic explosion that has made the, her universal fashion heritage. Two, attitude is the main style accessory. As a daughter and granddaughter of photographers, Frida Kahlo knew exactly what to do in front of the camera. She felt powerful in front of the camera's lens. With her straightforward poses, defiant attitude, and singular look, Frida presaged the supermodel gaze that stars out from the covers of fashion's magazines today. Frida defined one of fashion's magic words, attitude. 
she knew how to transform her insecurity and weakness into a fashion tool, proving that oftentimes how one wears something is more important than what one wears. Number three, masculine looks is very feminine. Long before Armani, she knew how to be avant-garde by introducing male silhouette in the female wardrobe and how to surprise with a transgressor image in her time. Four, fashion is therapeutic. In moments of vulnerability, she trusted the therapeutic power of fashion to rise her self-esteem. The more fragile her health, the more dynamic her look. The greater the pain and heart, the more luxurious and elaborated were her costumes. Even in her hospital bed, in her multiple convalescences, she portrayed herself with lips and nails in red, perfectly her style and decorated. She felt less like an invalid when she put more of an effort into her image. At the end of her life, she dressed every day as if she was going to a party. Five, beauty comes from characters. As she said, beauty and ugliness are a mirage. Everyone ends up seeing our inside. The shadow of a famous touch did not detract from her full, shapely lips. Frida did not bother to conceal her husky voice nor her boisterous laugh. She gestured with her hands and liked to use a rough vocabulary despite her delicate looking frame. She was a master at combining a touch of boldness with a healthy dose of self-confidence. Six, femininity and feminism are compatible. A strong and androgynous, she was exquisite, delicate, and flirty. Frida achieved something very unusual in her time, something that today is admired the conciliation between femininity and feminism. Without complex, she presumed a delicate appearance with the use of lace, embroidery, flowers, jewelry, and at the same time, she showed an energetic, brave, and fighting character, presuming a mustache and a unibrow. Seven, accessories dress more than clothes. She knew the power of a accessories like nobody else. She designed bits and gave volume to imitation jewelry to make it more visible. At a time when most jewels were small and delicate, Frida chose to use powerful forms that are current absolute tendencies. Fashion is defined by details, and Frida loved to show herself through her tinkling jewelry like an Aztec Princess. Eight, customize is a must. As a do-it-yourself pioneer, she used fashion to stand out and wanted not to be just one more with an inimitable style that made her unique. She interpreted it in a vanguard and visionary way in her most valued concept, identity, difference, and singularity. Flaws can be beautiful, number nine. An embodiment of the concept of beautiful, ugly, Jolie Led, Frida became a beauty inspiration through the wholeness and faithful acceptance of her natural appearance. She highlighted her flaws to vindicate the beauty of imperfection. She transformed her damaged body and her facial hair into her trademarks, although her bronze were naturally dark and thick. She made them even more dramatic by accentuating them with Revlon's black eyeliner. She intuited the power of personal branding before it was invented. 10, fashion is a message. Frida was one of the first women to use feminine garments to broadcast the feminist message of independence, work, and equality. Her fashion statements became life statements. 
She dressed herself as she felt. She drew a fetus on her corset as a morning due to the importance of motherhood. She was devoted to indigenous costumes to honor traditional Mexican customs. She cut her hair like a man as a sign of rebellion against her husband's infidelity and displayed her mustache and unibrow as a feminist outcry against chauvinist social conventions. Way before Moschino, Frida discovered the great potential of fashion as a message and transformed everyday items into sophisticated pieces. 11. Mestizaje is modernity. With a German father and a Oaxacan mother, Frida Kahlo embodies the paradigm of mestizaje. Beyond her blood heritage, she incorporated elements from pop culture, Aztec mythology, and European surrealism into her life and work. At times a passionate communist, Frida could also have belonged to the beat generation, to pan culture, to the indie scene, and to the hippie movement, because fundamentally, she championed a strong will against convictions. 12. Traditions empowers elegance. Frida had the vision to appreciate vintage items which still fits unique guardrobes and inspired runway's eclectic style. She kept her <coughs> Spanish grandmother's European fashion garments from the end of the 19th century and indigenous pieces from her mother's heritage and incorporated them into her elaborated outfits. As an avid shopper, Frida was fascinated by large department stores as well as small shops and she had a talent for finding valuable and beautiful items. This sentence is like fashion. Nothing is absolute, everything changes, everything moves, everything revolves, everything flies and goes away. 13, diversity makes a difference. Like fashion, color represents diversity. There are many Fridas because she interpreted many roles. Gay muse, lover, feminist, heroine, frustrated mother, politic activist, martyr, devout, adulterer, communist, declared atheist, universal artist. There are always a Frida that touches your heart. She incarnated the rebel spirit against conventionalism and provocation is fashion's best language. 14. Contrast activates looks. As an avant-garde stylist, she declared war to the total look as she believed in mix and match and in cheap and chic. She avoided predictable coordination and created harmony through contracts. The masculine against the feminine, luxury versus popular, European versus Mexican. She mixed and matched indigenous and western garments and accessories with important fabrics. English muslin, French velvet, Spanish silk, Asian satin, tradition and fashion in her hands continuously interacted. She was always, always creating her own distinctive variation on the original idea. The unpredictable was always more appealing to her. 15. Fashion may fade, style remains. Frida put into practice Coco Chanel's universal thinking, and she declared herself an enemy of fleeting trends. She considered a dress to be a masterpiece. She attended events in Paris or New York wearing indigenous blouses, voluminous skirts, and sculptural hairstyles braided with wool extensions. She dressed the same for a dinner with the Rockefellers in New York as a for a communist demonstration in Mexico. She was a visionary creating her identity and uniqueness. 16, to be fashionable, you don't need to be a victim. With her attitude, she became a precursor of just fashion, no victim. She put fashion to her service to highlight her virtues and conceal her flaws. 
she tried to minimize her corset of breast torso with blouses. Her long skirts hit her right leg's deformity affected by polio. She also corrected the imbalance in her gait by aiding before Ferragamo a lift to the souls. Frida Kahlo was a victim of her destiny, but not a victim of fashion. 17, individuality is an art. Frida Kahlo embraced individuality instead of trying to hide it. Without noticing, Frida personified her dearest friend, Elena Rubinstein, phrase, there are no ugly women, only lazy ones. Intuitively, she combined cultural aesthetics, historical perspective, and social reality. She spent hours in front of the mirror, meticulously designing her look with the same precision she would be applied to painting. The canvas was her mirror, and she was the painter, the model, and the painting, author, model, and painter, subject, and object. Frida was her own best work of art. 18, flower power pioneer. Frida anticipated the hippie movement and Coachella and made flowers her flag. Her thick wavy hair was her crowning glory. To her breasts, she would add extensions of dye wool, boats, tortoiseshell combs, or natural flowers, including bougainvilleas, peonias, and dahlias, which she cultivated, pampered, and cut from her garden. 19, queen of selfie. Frida showed us how to love yourself. She stated, I am my own muse. I am the subject I know best. In fact, in much the same way that Warhol manipulated popular images years before, sampling and Photoshop were invented, one could say Frida was the original queen of selfie. Nearly a century early than today's global obsession, she detected and compulsively exploited this human need to share one's image to feel less alone. Today, she could be a real influencer. She could be a media painter with a legion of followers that could be passionately love her wardrobe changes, her new acquisitions, and her blog posted messages. And 20, fashion as the art of being. Like Coco Chanel, she thought not to appear wealthy, but to show beautiful. Frida was an outsider. She broke the association between clothing and social class, making fashion a reflection of individual growth. Frida understood fashion as the art of being, not simply the effort of appearance. It is no wonder that her inimitable style continues to inspire designers and fashionistas all over the world. Frida is alive. Fashion has resurrected Mrs. Kahlo to give her the glory she didn't have during her life. Um, please welcome Circe Nestrosa, who curator, curated the uh, exhibition Appearances Can Be Deceiving, The Dresses of Frida Kahlo. Thank you, Tania, and thank you, first of all, to Tania Melendez, uh, Valerie Steele, and all the team at FIT for receiving us here. Um, thank you, Susana, also for um, sharing this presentation with us. And now I'm going to talk, uh, I'm going to tell you about this exhibition, which is the exhibition that Susana was mentioning. Susana and I uh, met when I presented um, the exhibition that is the first ever exhibition to show Frida Kahlo's wardrobe. This exhibition was um, opened in Mexico City at the Frida Kahlo Museum in 2012. And from a, from a temporary exhibition, it became a 
semi-permanent exhibition. So the exhibition is still on show at, at, the, at the Frida Kahlo Museum. And, um, and well, let's start. So what took me to do this exhibition? What you see here is Frida Kahlo wearing a Tewana dress. When I was conducting my, studies, my MA studies in fashion curation at London College of Fashion, it was only natural for me to look at my own roots. My family on my father's side comes from the Tehuantepec Isthmus, which is in the southern eastern part of Mexico. When you go to the Tehuantepec Isthmus, you see all women are dressed in this attire. I myself have these dresses. I'm aware of these dresses. So as I said, it was only natural for me to go back to my own roots. It is said that um, my great uncle and my aunt, who are also from this region, they were part of the, of the artistic circle of the 40s of Diego and Frida. And it is said that my aunt, Alfa Rios, was the first person to give Frida one of her Tijuana dresses. That's what it said in our, in our family, that's the, the, the story. I will never know that, but it is said by the scholars that, <laughs> that Alpha did bring some pieces to Frida Kahlo. So let me start by telling you a little bit about her. She was born in, in July, uh, on July 6, uh, 1907. She was one of the most prominent Mexican female artists known for her self-portraits. Her work has been celebrated internationally as emblematic of Mexican national and indigenous traditions and by feminist artists. Mexican culture and tradition have always been very important in, her, in Carlos' works. Frida's life was condensed. At the age of 21, she met, fell in love, she met and fell in love with Diego Rivera, and they got married. This passionate and tempestuous relationship survived infidelities, the pressures of Rivera's career, our divorce and remarriage, as well as Car Carlos' fragile health. Through the use of her self-portraits and the use of traditional Mexican dresses to style herself, Carlos dealt with her life, her political views, her health struggles, her accident, her turbulent marriage, and her inability to have children. Carlos' life began and ended in Mexico City in her home. Today is the Blue House, which is Frida Kahlo Museum. If you have the opportunity to visit this place ever, please do. This is one of the things you have to do before you die. <laughs> In April 2004, Carlos' wardrobe was discovered in the bathroom adjacent to her room. So that's her room in the house, and this is the bathroom. It was this bathroom that kept the objects of her wardrobe for more than 50 years. And it had been closed first by orders of Diego Rivera, and later on by Dolores Olmedo, who was a collector and a friend of the artist. What happened here is that Frida passed away in 1954. Then Diego Rivera passed away in 1957. So he said that the wardrobe and all these um, different um, places could be open after, uh, 15 years after he passed away. But then Dolores Olmedo, who was the first director of the museum, said, no, I'm not gonna open them. I'm gonna open them when I pass away. And she had a very long life, so she passed away. <laughs> she passed away in 2002. So 50 years later, then, uh, the director of the museum, um, Hilda Trujillo, and then the, the, the board decided that probably we were losing a huge archive, and they decided to open this magical sp a place. My original research was called Frida's Qu White Cabinet, and it was because everything was discovered in this small cabinet you see here. It has been said by different scholars that Frida Kahlo adopted this image, I mean this dress, to please Diego Rivera, who was very fond of the Zapotec women of this region. Nonetheless, far off just being a simple act of love, her use of ivory dress was a calculated stylis stylization and her logo. When the wardrobe was open, 
this photograph appear. And this was the first, the first clue when I started researching. The exhibition I'm presenting today shows Frida Kahlo's construction of identity through disability and ethnicity. So this photograph will mark the ethnicity inside of it, her choice for that dress. The myth that Diego encouraged her to assume this attire be began to crumble when this photograph appeared. Because here we see Frida's mother and all these family members dressed in the Tijuana traditions. This shows that she had this legacy far before meeting Rivera. So here you see her wearing the Tijuana headdress shown in her, one of her emblematic portraits. And this is one of the pieces of the archive. So now moving on to the part of disability, here you see two photographs. One when she's six years old, one when she is 18. Kahlo had polio when she was a little girl, leaving her with her right leg shorter than the left leg. And she describes how she used to, used to use long skirts to cover her imperfections, establishing a relationship with dress since a very early age. When she was 18, she was coming back from school and she was traveling in a bus um, that had a terrible accident, almost a mortal accident, um, because she had a, her bus had a, a crash with a tramway. The tramway, um, there was a big metal bar that pierced her pelvic bone all the way to the other side, leaving her with the impossibility to conceive children ever. So this is the only this is the only documentation Frida ever did of that accident. So these two events will also inform her choice of dress. Here we see um, her boots from the archive at the Frida Kahlo Museum, and you can see clearly the difference between the two legs. Her wardrobe is mostly composed of traditional Mexican pieces from Oaxaca and beyond, there are also ethnic garments from Guatemala and China, as well as an interesting collection of European and American blouses, jewelry, accessories, orthopedic devices, shoes, makeup. We found around 300 objects. And in her wardrobe, there are 16 Tijuana blouses, like the one she's wearing as she's painting, and 25 original Tijuana skirts, uh, some of them sewn personally by Frida. Um, this, the two Fridas is a very important um, painting um, because it really shows, as Susana mentioned, uh, mestizaje. Mestizaje means um, when you are uh, born, in the case of Mexico, from a European par um, father or the combination from uh, Spanish blood and, <coughs> sorry, and indigenous blood. So she was a mestiza, so this, this painting will show both her European side of her Hungarian father and her Mexican side on her um, mom, her Mexican mother. But also, this painting shows exactly what the, what the wardrobe has. And why would anything she did in her paintings or her life be any different to what she wore? So now I'm going to show you some of the pieces in the archive. So you can see how she painted them as the same way she wore them. And she will always style them. I'll, I'll explain you the styling in a bit. So you can see here that European, a bit more European attire. But you always see it will be composed by a long skirt and the whippeel or the cape, and then the adornment on the head. Because that's the composition of the Tijuana dress, and that will be very important in the geometry she establish, establishes with her own body, between the, her body and this dress. So she will also incorporate her casts as part of her, of her dress as a second skin. She will paint her casts as blouses because she had to live with them. And this is a very important photograph that also Susana was showing. 
Um, when I was conducting my investigation, it was very important to talk about Frida Kahlo's wardrobe, but also contextualize it in contemporary culture and contemporary fashion. Why is it important to talk about Frida Kahlo's wardrobe if it doesn't have a resonance with younger audiences or, or contemporary culture today? So this was crucial. It had been said also that her relationship with fashion was through a cover of Vogue that was Paris Vogue. So I went to Paris to look for this cover because that was very important for me to find in order to make a link with fashion. And I went to the Vogue archives there and they were like, no, 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 this doesn't exist. You're wasting your time. I said, can I come and see? Let me look for it. And they were like, oh, whatever, yeah. <laughs> Just come and see. I didn't find the cover. The cover doesn't exist. It's true. But I did find the copy of American Vogue of October 1937, which is this image. Due to then later Vogue's involvement as a huge sponsor of this exhibition, because it was Vogue magazine, the first fashion magazine that ever photographed Frida in a fashion context. And then we had the, the blouse and, and skirt that she wore. Um, as I was explaining to you, the construction of the Tijuana dress will inform uh, her choice of dress. In Mexico, we have over 100 traditional dresses. This dress, as I told you, comes from the Tehuantepec Isthmus. This is a matriarchal society. It's a, matriar a matriarchal society dominated by women. It's a dress that symbolizes a powerful woman. It's a dress that symbolizes, by the time she adopts it, portrays her Mexicanidad. She wanted to look very Mexican. She wanted to portray her political beliefs. She was a, co a communist. So it's, it's, a, it's a dress that solves many things at the, at the same time that helps her overcome her imperfections. And also the construction of the, of the, of the dress itself, as I was saying, um, it has, um, actually I have to move a little bit so you can see. I've got to and then the, está bien, creo que me oyen. You could hear me, yeah? Ah, okay. So you have a very long skirt, you have a whipil, which is a short uh, blouse, and then the um, headpiece. Here in this photograph, the reason why I put it there is because you can see whether she is standing or is sitting, she will always look like a queen because the short blouse will never crease because it's short. And also, the focus will be always from the torso up. She edited herself all the time. So when you look at her, because all the adornment is from the torso up, you will concentrate and look, the viewer will look at her always from here. Then I was, I almost died when I found this. this these photographs that she, the cut out photos of her own personal archive where she cuts people from the torso up. <laughs> so we continue now with, um, so now the relationship with fashion. In 1998, um, Jean-Paul Gaultier did, did, did this almost burlesque version of Frida Kahlo. And it was also the time when also Alexander McQueen was invited by Days and Confused to be guest editor. And he did this um, issue called Fashion Able. This is the first time ever that designers are even addressing disability as a question. And Alexander McQueen then questioned the way we perceive the different bodies and how as designers, I mean, as designers, how do we design for different bodies? Um, after 98, nothing else happened, but I will show you some of the relationships with, with fashion. It was just curious that by the same time Galtier is the same year that then he uses the corset inspiring Frida in this version. Um, Yunya Watanabe in 2000, so you see a little bit of that relationship there. Comme des Garçons, 
spring summer 2012. For me, it was very important to contextualize again, as I said, with fashion, because in order to make the, the, the exhibition relevant, it was relevant in, in, in this topic of fashion because a lot of designers had been already inspired, artists and um, many people, photographers. So it, she was part of, she has been adopted by popular culture. This is Ricardo Tichy's for Givenchy, and this is almost like both of the topics together. We were very, very lucky. If you can see, I mentioned that her accident had been, when she had been pierced in the pelvic bone, you see this dress, how it has the, the pelvic bone, it's almost like a skeleton, showing the disability part plus all the lace, and it's almost like a modern version of of Kahlo, and this is homage to Frida Kahlo, a 2010 fall winter for Givenchy. Now I'm gonna show you the exhibition, the making of and the exhibition, so I'm just gonna flip, flip, flip. Remember the two um, strands are um, disability and ethnicity, so I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna take you through it. Um, the exhibition was produced by a very international team. Uh, I'm originally Mexican, we brought, uh, the designer of the show is Judith Clark. Um, she is based in London, so we, took the pro we did the production there. So you can see a bit of the making. This is at the Museo Frida Kahlo. There is a bit of the making of the exhibition, so you can see what it takes. This is Angelo Seminara. He's Italian, and, but based in the UK, and he won British Titles of the Year. So we were fortunate, fortunate enough to have him as the, the headpieces with the symbols. I mean, the butterfly and, and wings are always very important in, in all Carlos metaphoric symbols. So these are all her original personal belongings. So this is before the opening. So here you see the first, um, this is the origins, the first gallery. Origins reminds you, us of where the objects were discovered. This is about the bathroom where the objects were discovered. So we decided to put this tile a white tiles uh, wall to remind the viewer where all these objects were discovered, but also to remind the viewer the amount of time that she spent in hospital. She had around 22 um, chirurgical um, intervention. So this is her prosthetic leg. Um, she had to have that leg amputated in 1953, and she never recovered from that one. Then she died, she passed away in July 1954. This is a prosthetic leg. But you can see how ahead of her time she was, why should be prosthetic, why should they be ugly? They can be beautiful like this. So she was an artist all the time and all her life. So this is the kind of more traditions part of the exhibition. I did the captions, low captions, in case someone came with a wheelchair, because when talking, with, um, talking about the topic of disability, you need to make everything accessible, so all the details have to be there for everyone. To make this exhibition completely democratic to everyone, because that's the way she was. Um, this is the cabinet of curiosities, is where I establish that geometry. So I dissect the body here in different parts, marking the adornment, explaining what I was telling you from the torso up. And the worse she felt, the more she would adorn herself. 
But look at how contemporary these are her sunglasses. This is a Tawana style jewelry, all in gold. The cigarette case. And then now we go to the contemporary part of the exhibition. If you see, um, the contemporary side of the exhibition is all in white because everything herself was in color. And for the contemporary, I decided also to put everything just in, in white. So here you see that the tiles now become the runway. This makes a connection with the first, um, with the first gallery, which was the, cor the, were the, or the orthopedic devices, because also the selection of the contemporary designers had to do with, the bo with both topics, disability and ethnicity. So this is kind of more the disability side of things. So you can see the painting there, so it's all style as she would style it. So Gautier does another version of the corset, of the black corset. Actually, I didn't put the black corset because it was black. So then he had this other one. So he said, OK, I'll give you this other one, which is what you want. But it's the same piece. I said, OK, cool. <laughs> <laughs> So if you see also everything is metal, it reminds us uh, everything um, in Frida's rooms, most of it was uh, in wood because it's softer, so then we go back to metal here as well. So this is, again, this is Ricardo Tichy for Givenchy also. We were so lucky. They pay for everything and sent us everything and now they donated address to the museum, so we we're like, ah! This is, this is really a truly fabulous collection. I think he is really, he puts together both topics. You see all the elements of tradition, flowers, lace, um, the wings. It's almost as he had seen this drawing. And this drawing was really the the beginning of this investigation, this research. If you see, you see Frida here um, naked. You see her right leg um, slightly thinner. You see her corset piece and her column and then the dress, the Tijuana dress. And if you see, it's almost as Ricardo Tichy had seen this drawing and he never saw this drawing. This drawing is called Appearances Can Be Deceiving, which is the name of the exhibition. So I will just end up with the cover of Vogue Mexico, because since the cover had never been produced, Vogue decided to pay homage to the exhibition and do the cover of Frida Kahlo, but this time for Vogue Mexico, where, is, where Kahlo is from. Thank you. Um, a few of you have given us your questions, so we're going to be sitting here. I'll be translating the questions for Susana and her answers, and, um, and I'll be reading the questions to them. So if you have any additional questions, please write, in, write them down and give them to one of our museum volunteers who are here when they could be doing something else and not getting paid to allow you to enjoy this event. Thank you. So, this is first um, a clarification question, so um, that's the first question that I'm going to ask. It's for Circe, and the question um, is, why did the museum director wait um, until her death to open the museum? So if you could explain the museum and what was opened. Uh, uh, oh. Yeah, um, this was because, I mean, as I was explaining, um, Diego Rivera is almost as he, he knew almost that he was going to pass away also in, I mean, if she was, she passed away in 1954, and then he passed away in 1957, so he arranged everything, he made sure that all their, actually, I don't know if you know, I mean, it's, um, 
everything to do with Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo is very complicated because Diego Rivera actually left the Central Bank of Mexico in, as the carer of all their um, artworks and, and, and belongings. So his very good friend, Dolores Olmedo, um, it is said also that they were lovers, um, lovers, but this is not confirmed, it's pure gossip. But anyway, but I have to say, she absolutely loved him because he did every single thing he asked her to do. So she was the first director of the Museo Frida Kahlo, La Casa Azul, and she kept the museum alive with her own money. And she finished um, the Anahuacali, which is where he kept his pre Hispanic collection. And what happened here is that when he said that they could open these archives 15 years after he died, I mean, I guess she knew what, uh, what there was, but then she decided that, no, I'm not going to open them. I don't know why. We don't know exactly why she decided that, but then she decided to open them, or like people could open them after she passed away. And um, so that's what happened. But, but the museum was open. It was only a room with their belongings that um, stayed, that, was that, that, was that stayed, remained closed. I mean, yeah, I, I think, yeah, she knew things were there. But also the, the um, director of the board, who is um, Carlos, Carlos Phillips, is her son. So he continues to be the carer of, of the archives. So then um, the director of the museum, after, after Dolores Olmedo, is Hilda Trujillo, and then Carlos, they decided to, they felt they were probably losing a huge archive, of course, and when this was open, then it opened the possibilities to, for us to know more about her. So it was great that they, that we could have access to these amazing treasures. Now, this is a question for both, um, both of you. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, what was the emotional impact of working on Frida and on working with Frida's belongings? So, what was the impact emotional of working with Frida? For me. Pues eh, el impacto emocional eh, fueron muchos. Eh, creo que fiarte del instinto, confiar en que el instinto es la inteligencia que sale del corazón, como a ella le sucedió, eh, probablemente sea lo que más me me ha influido a mí o me ha impactado a mí. Um, that uh, it was understanding that instinct, what comes out of your heart, is um, which is something that that's the way that Frida operated. Is it's been learning to do that. That that has been one of the greatest impacts for Susana while putting together this book. And we have a copy here so you can see it. Um, Eh, recuerdo muchas cosas. Eh, she can remember many things. Probablemente eh, algo a lo que hago referencia en el libro, que cuando tienes un sueño y consigues llevarlo a cabo, hay que tener el arrojo de saber soñar otro nuevo. Um, so something that she mentions in the book is that um, when you have a dream, you have to be brave and pursue it, but you also have, once you achieve it, you have to come up with new dreams. Y luego otra de las frases que han aparecido en la presentación, que creo que mejor la definen y que más me ha impactado, más que una frase de Frida, es una forma de comportarse and that there's a phrase that was in the presentation that more than a phrase that um, Frida mentioned is a way of behaving. Y es que eh, el dolor es inevitable, pero el sufrimiento siempre es opcional. And, and it is that um, pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. Now you, Circe. Um, what was the emotional impact of working with Frida's, Frida's belongings? 
Wow. <laughs> I mean, I, th I think I, um, we met Frida for the first time there. It was incredibly intimate, and we understood her from her, yeah, from her personal belongings, the clothes still have a smell. The, you've, we found an incredib incredibly, um, how to say, coquettish woman. I mean, she enjoyed makeup, she loved jewelry, she was um, very feminine in that respect, very delicate. And um, and I, I guess yeah that was really our uh, as as with the Frida Kahlo Museum team I mean the conservators and curators so we went through the whole because this was about dress and it was about herself and what she wore but the archive has uh, her medicine I mean we have in her hospital um, items she used all her medicine I mean. There are many, many things. So yeah, it was, it's, it was why we feel very, very lucky. Mm -hmm. And um, another question that's related um, is, you both knew Frida Kahlo before you started on this project, but how did this, um, working on this change the way you see yourself, you see yourselves as women, as a woman? Pues, eh, ¿quieres que…? <risa> Yo eh, creo que, que de alguna manera voy a volver otra vez a comentar que eh, lo que me ha hecho pensar muchísimo es que desde el dolor se puede generar belleza. Eh, cada vez que veo todos los… Bueno, sí. um, She's saying that what really struck her was the fact that from pain you can develop beauty. Eh, como mujer me ha hecho pensar que la perfección está sobrevalorada. And as a woman it's made me think that perfection is overvalued. Sobredimensionada. That it's given a higher dimension than it really has. Y creo que con Frida, como mujer, yo he aprendido a valorar la belleza imperfecta. And with Frida I learned to value imperfect beauty. Que es la belleza que se ve con los ojos del corazón. And that's the beauty that you can see through the eyes of your heart. Um, well, for me, yes, it has changed radically and of course, it, incredibly inspiring for all of us, I think, um, not only because of her avant-garde vision and, and everything. I mean, for me, um, what's really interesting to see how she overcame her, her physical condition and her disabilities through dress. Um, when I was conducting my research, there was hardly anything written about fashion and disability. And this is the case today the way she didn't let her disabilities define her is really inspiring. And I have decided to now engage in a PhD that works on fashion and disability because the, the literature is, is dry and it continues to be dry. And I think it's, it's something that from this research I have decided to engage in. I want to conduct something that um, there are many people doing PhDs, but I think as, as academics we should engage in PhD that is relevant and makes an impact in society. And I think fashion has transformational powers and it can really change people's lives and this is an area I will be investigating. <laughs> okay. so, um, this is another question, I think, for Circe. Um, one, was Frida always in physical pain? And two, at what age did she die? Can take. <laughs> she died at the age of 47 years old. And um, I think it was after her, I think with the polio she was 
okay. I think the physical pain and the deterioration of her body started more when she had the accident at the age of 18. And that's the beginning of a career of a great artist, but of course then the deterioration of her body started there. And like more obvious. So yeah, thank you. Um, and this is a, a question for, to let your imaginations fly. Um, but uh, if she lived today, what do you think, what designers do you think she would wear? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I gave Susanna um, a little bit of notice, so she'll answer first. Um, pues yo lo tengo muy claro, sería Jean-Paul Gaultier. <laughs> eh, creo que porque es un, además de un magnífico diseñador, un magnífico estilista. Um, the, uh, the first, uh, that it wasn't a difficult question for Susana at all, that she thinks that Jean-Paul Gaultier would be her top choice. Gaultier is a magnífico estilista y a la, great stylist. Y la moda no ha creado un disfraz de Frida Kahlo para la noche de Halloween. La moda no, no, el homenaje que ha hecho la moda no es obvio. That he didn't create a Halloween costume of Frida um, in his designs, but he made a homage to her. That's not obvious. Elegiría a Gaultier probablemente porque um, por la actitud que tiene y porque siempre ha sido un revolucionario que ha sabido eh, reírse de la vida y ser fiel a su estilo. Estoy convencida de que serían Eh, seguro que íntimos amigos. Um, because he's a revolutionary who has been able to laugh at life and be very true to his style. Um, so she's, uh, she's positive that if, if they were both alive at the same time, they would be very, very good friends. <laughs> um, that's a tricky question, actually. This is a cheeky audience. It's a cheeky audience. <laughs> um, I think it's a, as um, I do also think she was the first creator of the selfie, as Susanna was correctly saying. I think she would continue styling herself with different things. And she would put together the look in a way, and she would be having a million or, I don't know, more, let's say. Kim Kardashian has like 22 million or something crazy. Of course, we're not even comparing. She would have 30 million <laughs> after styling. She, I think she would put, uh, she would use still her body to um, style herself and, and really combine different designers and different styles. I mean, and I think for her it was more about the style. And um, so I think she would use different designers. <laughs> okay, and this is the last question before we go to the, um, book signing uh, portion of the evening. And if both of you can say, what was the single most surprising thing that you learned about Frida during your research? So, you Circe first, while well, I translate. Oh, I mean, yes, yeah, I was saying, I, um, it was how we, how we found an, an incredible, an incredibly, um, really, feminine, I mean, incredibly feminine woman and that she that loved perfumes and loved uh, makeup and loved all these um, beautiful things. I mean, she, she really enjoyed um, dressing up. And that was really, it, it, was, it was just just very nice, something that you could only perceive through going through her things. <laughs> so yeah. Susana. Pues eh, lo que más eh, me ha sorprendido en mi investigación para hacer el libro ha sido sin duda cómo Frida de manera instintiva y autodidacta. So uh, the most surprising thing has been how Frida uh, very instinctively and in a self-taught manner sentó las bases y el fundamento de la moda contemporánea. She really laid the foundation for what we now understand as contemporary fashion. La pasión por el vintage. Um, passion for vintage. El mix and match. Mix and match. El look masculino. 
um, the man, mas, masculine look. Y sobre todo eh, la actitud, la actitud como el mejor accesorio de estilo. And attitude as the best uh, styling accessory. Um, so if you please uh, join me in thanking our speakers tonight. Thank you. Thank you.